Hello, my name is Rich Obrecht. Please stand with me as we read the Word of God. Today's passage of Scripture is Luke 10, 38 through 42. Now, as they went on their way, Jesus entered a village, and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. And she had a sister called Mary, who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to his teaching. But Martha was distracted with many with much serving. And she went up to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Tell her then to help me. But the Lord answered, Mar answered her, Martha, Martha, you are anxious and troubled about many things, but one thing is necessary. May his, Mary has chosen the good portion, which will not be taken away from her. This is the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Two quick additional announcements before we jump in to our text of study this morning. One is that less than 24 hours before my plane gloriously took off to um, Cancun, I got a text message from um, our executive pastor candidate that we would brought in that he was accepting the job, had the chance to talk to him, and so we have a new executive pastor that will be starting April 3rd, and I, yeah, <laughs> praise Jesus. I relaxed just a little bit better after that. Um, Praise the Lord. It was great. Um, and then secondly, I want to say thank you to Rob for preaching last week. I've heard numerous um, just wonderful reports. So thank you, brother. All right. And as you can see, I, I brought back a few tacos with me. So um, just kidding. I... Uh, I was walking through the airport, um, heading back from uh, vacation after a great week, and, and having traveled with just our carry-on bags, I was praising Jesus. Because that, that's a great feeling, isn't it? To have everything that you need for the week with you. You know they can't screw it up. And I remembered back to um, a trip we took when our son, our oldest son, Ethan, was six months old. And we went to um, Cabo San Lucas as a family with Kelly's folks. And I can remember Ethan being six months old. And so we didn't have just carry on at that point in time. In fact, we had carry everything with us. And we had a pack and play for him to sleep in. We had a car seat for him to ride in. We had golf clubs to get away from him. And we, I mean, I felt like, and then every pair of clothing we owned, right? I mean, we were walking through that airport in Cabo, and I'm thinking to myself, are we going on vacation or are we moving here? Like, if you've been there, if you've ever had that experience, you know that feeling of somebody give me a hand and help me out. And I, I think life feels like that sometimes, doesn't it? I mean, life, life feels like we're just, we're walking through the terminal and we've got everything in our hands and it's a little bit too much to carry. You ever been there? Where, where, I mean, we have the expectations that surround us. Some of them we've put on ourselves, and, and some of them we've just adopted from the society, the culture that we live in. We, we have the obligations that we rightfully need to do. We have the bills that need to be paid, the job that needs to be worked. We, we've got to wake up Monday morning and, and get after it. Some of us, we, we carry around in this, in this pile of stuff. We also put religion on top of that. Right? And we, we want to spend time with God, and, and that's important to us. And, and some of us, we also we carry around some past baggage. We carry around some regrets. We par carry around some of our failures. Some of us carry around guilt. And doesn't it feel sometimes like you're walking through the terminal, and you've just got the weight of the world surrounding you? Am I, am I alone in this? That sometimes it can feel like we're, we're carrying a number of things in life. And if we were to go around this room and, and we were to just do a survey, most of us would say statistically that we are over busied people. Some of us would say we're, we're hurried. If we have a little bit more self awareness, we go, Yeah, I'm not just busy, but like this internal condition of my soul is one of, of hurry. And some of us would say that I feel like I'm carrying the weight of the world and I'm still coming up short. 
I've got my list of things to do. I've got my calendar. I've got my task list. And I accomplish all of it. And at the end of the day, I feel like I'm just carrying these things and missing the world around me. And yet, I don't feel like I'm doing enough. I, or, or, or I don't feel like I'm doing the right stuff. I'm just doing whatever is in front of me. And sometimes, isn't it true, that the things that we carry, expectations, obligations, guilt, sometimes the things that we carry, even the good stuff we carry, causes us to miss the beauty of the life that God's invited us to live. And it's that circumstance that Jesus invites us to explore in our hearts and our souls this morning through Luke chapter 10. If you have a Bible, would you open there with me? Because we're going to read another encounter of Jesus. We've been walking through a series of encounters as we're leading up to Easter and our celebration of the resurrection and the season of the church calendar that we call Lent. And we're, we're looking at different encounters that Jesus had with people on his journey to the cross in the book of Luke. And he has a number of different encounters, and these encounters change people in certain ways. And this passage notwithstanding, this is one of those passages that has this way of sticking with us because we can relate so distinctly to it. Listen again as we read the scriptures. Now, as they, and that's Jesus and these women, his disciples presumably with him, as they went on their way, Jesus entered a village. And a woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to his teaching. But Martha was distracted with much serving. And she went up to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me alone to serve? So two characters, two primary characters in our story. One is Martha. And Martha does everything right. Uh, Martha lives by the cultural book of the day. See, if an itinerant Jewish rabbi were walking through your town, one who had performed miracles, you better believe that if he came into your house, you should welcome him. Hospitality was a huge value for these people. To not have provided a meal for Jesus would have been as though Martha slapped him in the face. It would have been a cultural faux pas. So, so Martha's doing exactly what's expected of her. She's doing what everybody else in her culture would have done. Mary, on the other hand, has thrown the book out the window if she ever had the book of what was culturally acceptable. Right? She is taking the place at the feet of the rabbi, which was the place that was reserved for really important people. And Mary, if you read about her in John chapter 11 and John chapter 12, had a little bit of a, of a shady past. She had some things in her past that she probably would have liked to have kept at a distance and out of the scriptures if she had her choice. And she just goes and she plops her feet down right in the midst of where every Pharisee and every other teacher of the law should have been. In fact, if you go and read John chapter 12, you'll see Mary taking a um, jar of expensive perfume, breaking it and anointing Jesus' feet with it, and then taking her hair and washing his feet. She's just uninhibited. She is going after it with everything that she has, and she's breaking all of the rules while she does it. So I'll put my cards on the table this morning. I'm a Martha sympathizer. <laughs> Somebody's got to make the dinner. <laughs> it's not going to make itself. No microwaves back in those days. No freezers to just pop something out of. Thank you very much. Somebody's got to pay for the house that Jesus shows up to eat in, right? Somebody's got to make sure everything is there that's necessary for life. Any women want to say amen to that? <laughs> yeah. And sometimes I've heard this passage taught, and it's like, hey, here's what you should do. You just need to, you just need to stop everything that you're doing. You need to drop it, and you need to go sit at the feet of Jesus. The only problem with that is that it doesn't work. The only problem with that is somebody's got to pay the mortgage. 
Somebody's got to get up Monday morning and go to work. Some, somebody's got to prepare dinner if you're going to eat. I've heard this passage taught where, where the, the bottom line is you just need to stop your ex, the expectations that are on you, the responsibilities that you rightfully have, even if they're caring for kids that God loves, that he's given to you as a gift, right? You've got to stop doing everything that you're doing so that you can do this one thing. And we all know that doesn't work in real life. And we all know there's some people who can do that. But if all of us did that, the very fabric of our society would break down. It's impossible. We, this just in, we can't all do that. Some of us have to get up on Monday morning and go to work. I'm a Martha sympathizer. But I have great news for you. That's not what Jesus is saying at all. Jesus is not saying that you need to quit your job. Jesus is not saying that you need to shirk your responsibilities. Jesus is not saying that there's only one thing that you can carry. In fact, the news is so much better than that. Listen to what Jesus is saying. And the reason that this story is in the scriptures. But the Lord answered Martha. This is after Martha complains that Mary is not joining him. Are joining her in the kitchen, but, but, Martha, but the Lord answered, Martha, Martha, you're anxious and you're troubled about many things. But read this with me, church. But one thing is necessary. Th this word necessary, if you were to go and dig in the Greek to find out what it really means, here's what the word necessary means. It means that which is essential for the journey. So here's what it doesn't mean. And here's what Jesus is not saying. What Jesus is not saying is you can only carry one thing and figure out what it's going to be. What Jesus is not saying is, man, who cares what you eat? What Jesus is not saying is that there's only one thing you can carry. He's saying there's one thing you must be sure you're carrying. What he's not saying is that there's only one thing you should do. What he's saying is there's one thing you cannot miss. And that's a big difference, isn't it? That's a huge difference. See, he goes on to say, but one thing is necessary. And he doesn't leave it ambiguous as to what it is. He says Mary has chosen the good portion. Mary's chosen that which is absolutely necessary. So you zoom back and what's the picture of what's necessary for our lives as human beings in relationship to God? The one thing that's necessary, the one thing that we must be sure we're carrying, sure, in addition to other responsibilities and other expectations and other things that we have, the one thing that has to be under everything is sitting at the feet of Jesus is being in proximity to the Messiah. Now, Jesus will say it like this in John chapter 6. He says, it's the Spirit who gives life. And, and it's not just this life as in the breath that you take. It's the, the life that actually makes the breath that you take worth taking. That kind of life. It's the Spirit who gives life. The flesh is no help at all. The words, this is Jesus speaking, the words I have spoken to you are spirit, and say it with me, church, life. He goes, Here, here's the thing you can't miss. You cannot miss that you were created at the very core of your soul to be in relationship with an almighty God. That's what you can't miss. You can't miss that you were created uniquely and specifically by your creator for a purpose. You can't miss that. You cannot miss that the one who created it all and spoke every single star into existence and calls them out by name speaks a better word over your life of love and of blessing and of goodness. You can't miss that. You can't miss that. I started to wonder, what did, what did Mary hear as she sat at the feet of Jesus? Just to hear him in a living room teach I wonder if he taught her that blessed are the, are the poor in spirit, Mary. And 
blessed are those who mourn because they're going to be comforted. I wonder if he taught Mary that, man, the, those, that anger you're carrying, that lack of forgiveness in, in your soul that you have, that Mary, those things are just, they're zapping life from you like nobody's business. And you feel like you're carrying the weight of the world, Mary, because your past is just so prevalent. It's all you can see. I wonder if the Messiah just ripped those things out of her hand. There's only one thing that's absolutely essential. And what Jesus seems to think is that sitting at his feet shapes the way we live every single day. That's what he's teaching, that we are, before we're human doings, we are human beings, and our connection to our creator is absolutely essential. That he did not create you to live life for him. Rather, he created you to live life with him. And those are two very different things. And see, union with God is the absolute bottom line essential of why you were created, is to be in relationship with God. And so Jesus says, when we do that, it shapes the way we do everything else. And when we, when we identify our priority, we awaken our life. And th that's what Martha missed. It's interesting because this word priority came into the English language around the 1400s and had a pretty good run, priority did. From 1400 to 1500, priority did not have a plural to go along with it. Did you know that? 500 years, there was no such thing as priorities, which if you think about it, makes a little bit of sense. Because priority literally means that which is before everything else, or that which is first. Now, we would love to believe, wouldn't we, that we can have priorities. A bunch of things that's at the top. I mean, this is our multitasking world that we live in. The more we can do at one time, the more we can accomplish. Um, this just in also, the, the statistics that support that aren't actually there. It turns out the more you try to do, the less you accomplish. So for 500 years, people would have looked at us and said, priorities? You can't have priorities. You can only have a priority. And Jesus would say, yes and amen. A priority. A thing at the very top of everything that shapes the way you do everything else. Listen to the way he said it in Matthew chapter 6. After talking about worry and anxiety around what we'll eat, around what we'll wear, things that we need. Here's what Jesus says. He says, but, but seek first. Seek first. Not, not only, but seek first before you do anything else, before you pick up all the other stuff that you have to carry, the dinner you have to make, the kids that you have to get to go somewhere, the job that you have to work in order to pay the mortgage, the relationships, all that other stuff. That, that stuff's good, that stuff's fine, that stuff's necessary. But before you do anything else, do this. Seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all of these other things will be added unto you. See, here's what Jesus is saying, and, and you have to sort of peel back the layers a little bit, because what we hear is seek first the kingdom of God, like try really hard to go to heaven, <laughs> try, try really hard to do these things, and that's not what Jesus is saying. What Jesus is saying is align your life with the reality of the way I created the universe. Seek first the kingdom of God. Allow the rule and the reign of God to be a person who lets go of bitterness and rage and anger, to be a person who embraces the way of love rather than hate, to be a person who says, I will forgive those who wrong me regardless of how many times they do it. Seek first that kingdom. And then Jesus says, when you do that, the stuff that you're carrying, the, the good stuff, the, the stuff you need to carry to live and eat, it's not that you won't have to carry those things anymore. It's just that you'll have a different way of carrying them. Right? So, so there's more than one way to carry a stack of boxes, isn't there? Right? 
So when we seek first the kingdom, here's what starts to happen in our life. Sure, sure, there's certain things that we'll weed out of our life. There's certain things that we'll go, this is absolutely not necessary, and that's an important exercise to go through. I'll talk about it in a few minutes. But I think primarily what we find is that we carry the same stuff in a very different way. Like, have you noticed that when you spend time in the presence of Jesus, that some of the things that used to rub you the wrong way don't seem to rub you the wrong way? That some of the people that really annoy you, I mean, we all have these kind of people in our life, don't we? The, the people that just occupy your time and annoy the living daylights out of you. If you don't have anybody like that, you might be like that for somebody else. So, <laughs> this box is for you, right? But yeah, but when we're healthy people, when our soul is filled because the words of life are penetrating our soul, those things affect us differently, don't they? Yeah, I'll, I'll take the two nods to be like, yeah, you guys are, yeah. They do. They do. And that's what Jesus is teaching. And that's what Jesus is saying. When we identify our priority and we put the big rock in first, which is being with our Messiah, being with our Savior, hearing his words, hearing his voice, everything else starts to change. So here's the way that this story goes on. Because what Jesus is going to do and what Dr. Luke is going to do through the retelling of this story is he's going to drop these little sort of heart conditions in in regards to Martha that are going to be signals to us as to how we know if we're living in the Jesus first way. And so as we unpack this, the question, two questions I want you to ask. One is, as we talk about this life with Jesus as a priority, does it reflect where you are? The second question is, does this first thing we're going to identify more adequately describe the way that you live most days? And if so, maybe it's because you're not truly sitting at the feet of your Savior. Verse 40. But Martha was, say it with me, church, distracted. Distracted. In the Greek, the word literally means to be driven about mentally. So before Jesus ever suggests that Martha is doing the wrong thing, Jesus suggests, or Dr. Luke suggests, that she has the wrong attitude. She's over-busied. She's overburdened. She's, she's hurried. And she's missing what's right in front of her. I, I saw this video, short little clip, a few weeks ago that I think adequately describes this condition of being either driven about mentally or over-occupied or too busy. You might be able to relate to it. It's an interview that a man was doing on BBC from his home office, live television, and you'll see what happened as he did this interview. All the time, the question is how do you define the most scandal? Uh, and what will it mean for, uh, for the wider region? I think one of your children has just walked in. I mean, shift, shifting, shifting sands in the region, do you think relations with the North may change? Um, I would be surprised if they do. <laughs> the, um, pardon me. Pardon me. My apologies. What will this mean for the region? My apologies. <laughs> I love it. I love it because it's never happened to me, right? Like, can you imagine my three kids coming out on stage? And I love he just hits them right in the head. National television just boom, get away from me, child. Whose children are these? This is crazy, right? I love it. And here's the thing. I think it's a picture of if we were to jump inside each other's minds, that's what our mind looks like a lot of times, isn't it? <laughs> Distracted. Like, okay, that thought needs to go away. That past regret needs to go away. That burden I'm carrying, I mean, it's just blocking me from seeing the life that Jesus has intended me to live. Here's the reason that I love this story. It's a modern parable. It's the story of modernity. We're over-busied people, aren't we? I mean, statistically, they would say that 67% of women and 86% of men work far more than 40 hours a week. 
they'd also say that well over half of us never take our allotted vacation time. They would also say that we sleep two fewer hours on average than our great-grandparents 100 years ago did. You think that doesn't affect us as human beings, as people? You think that doesn't make it feel like, man, I'm doing more than I feel like I can legitimately do, and I still don't feel like I'm getting enough done? Sure, it certainly does. And so Jesus speaks into this a better word. But before we can just distance ourselves from this totally, he speaks to church people too. Because listen, he says, Martha was distracted with much serving. And if you were to do a word study of this word serving, what you'd find is that a number of different areas in the New Testament, this word serving is translated ministry. Martha was distracted with much ministry. See, see, so Jesus doesn't let religious people live under the cloak of religiosity. He sort of pulls that cloak back and goes, okay, let's, let's talk for a moment because you can be serving the creator lunch and miss that he's in your, ki- he's in your family room. You can be serving the almighty king of the world and not actually communing with him. See, Martha's over-occupied with ministry and she's missing the very thing that she needs to adequately minister. And so Jesus pushes on us to say, busyness does not equal faithfulness. Just because you're busy serving Jesus does not mean that your heart is full of the very thing that you want to give to others. See, godly service flows from sitting at his feet, not just serving him lunch. And when we prioritize the right thing, it helps clarify everything. And so we move from this place of distraction, over-busied, over-burdened, to this place of clarity. And here's the thing, here's the thing. Just to be really honest with you guys, I, this is hard. I, I am standing up here preaching to the choir. I live in the suburbs. I have three kids. Raising kids is a sport in the suburbs, right? <laughs> and it is so hard to feel like, man, everybody else is getting a little bit ahead. And if we don't get our kids involved in every single thing, we're going to deprive them of the thing that's necessary for their soul to live and thrive and survive. And it's impossible. You know, the good news is that statistically, the kids who are involved in everything differ very little from kids that are involved in nothing. You know what the common denominator is for healthy, well-balanced adults in their childhood years? Is a house that's stress-free and loving. So it turns out, our desire to do more for our kids might actually be taking things away from our kids. That's just for free, though. Because here's what we start to see is that Martha gets caught in the hamster wheel that we often get caught in. And there's two things that that really steal Martha's joy in sitting at the feet of her master. One is expectation. She's got the cultural expectations that are just pressing in. You've got to serve the rabbi lunch. You've got to make sure that he's taken care of. And those are the expectations as parents we carry. And if you're not a parent, you're in a different place in life. There's certain expectations that we all have. The question is, have we prioritized the main thing before we've added everything? The second is the immediate. Jesus is here and he needs lunch. The rabbi is hungry. Now, here's the thing. We don't know for sure, but I doubt seriously that Jesus walked into our house and said, listen, Martha, I could really use some nachos. Starving here. No, no. She put this burden on herself. And so what she decided was the immediate is more important than the eternal. And before we start throwing stones at her, remember, I'm a Martha sympathizer, We do the same thing all the time, don't we? That the immediate steals our focus 
steals our time, steals our energy, that we start carrying the boxes around instead of having it prioritized in such a way where we go, yeah, I can carry this and, and I can do it in a healthy way. A recent study revealed that, that young adults, this is the demographic they looked at, look at their phone over 85 times a day. Can you imagine the immediate taking us in so many different directions? So Paul has this life ethos that he invites us to embrace. And here's what he says. For me, to live is Christ. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, to live is to be with the one who created me to be with him. To die is gain. Charles Spurgeon, the great preacher, said it like this. He said, lives with many aims, like water trickling through innumerable streams, or like water trickling through innumerable streams, none of which are wide enough or deep enough to float the merest cockle shell of a boat. But a life with one object is like a mighty river flowing between its banks, bearing to the ocean a multitude of ships and spreading fertility on either side. I don't know about you, but I, I want my life to be a waterfall. Not, not a trickle of a stream. The question we have to wrestle with then is, is our priority of being with the one who has the words of life identified and implemented as our priority? If not, we're probably distracted and Jesus is inviting us to a renewed sense of clarity this morning. Here's how the passage continues. The Lord answered her, this is Martha, after, after Martha says, Hey, Jesus, um, I'm not sure if you're aware, but I'm sort of in the kitchen alone. If you could do something about it, that'd be great. I don't know if you've ever told Jesus what to do. <laughs> Usually doesn't work all that well, doesn't work out well for me. I'm not sure how it goes for you, but here's what he says. Martha, you are anxious. Literally, Martha, your mind is divided into parts. And they're tearing you in a bunch of different directions. And doesn't this make so much sense? If her priority isn't identified and it isn't clarified, then certainly life comes away and it divides us. But when it is pri when we are prioritized, when we do know what the only necessary thing is for the journey, well, then it helps us move from this place of anxiety or division to a place of of being centered. And, and if you're scared of like new age type words, your red flags went up, I get it. I chose the word because it starts with C. And I need that for my, okay, that and, that, that and, that it is the opposite of being divided. That what Jesus is doing is inviting us to have a life that's, that's grounded, a life that's focused, a life that not only knows where we stand, but more importantly, who we stand with. Instead of being tossed about by whatever the immediate and the expected need of the day is, to know underneath it all, I am loved by the King of kings and the Lord of lords. That underneath my failures is a waterfall of grace that I could never out sin. That underneath it all, Jesus the Messiah spread out his arms, walked to his cross, shed his blood, and gave me his righteousness. In a world where the waves and the wind rage, Jesus invites us to be centered, anchored, grounded, unified in him. In him. And see, when we start to worry, what we really need to do, our, our, our MO when we start to worry is, I've got to do more, I've got to try harder, I've got to work harder. And what Jesus says is, no, 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 no. Come on, just come back, spend some time at my feet, recalibrate your heart and your life around the deepest reality in the universe that you are loved by the maker of it all. And then you'll carry the stuff in your life in a little bit different way. See, the Apostle Paul will write about this in Philippians chapter 4, where he says this. He says, don't be anxious about anything, which 
Don't we wish we could just put that on a task list and be like, done. (laughs) But he gives us the anecdote to anxiety or worry. But in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be known to God. Sit at the feet of Jesus. Be with him. When anxiety starts to rise, don't hit fast forward. Hit pause and go and be with him because that's what's off and then the peace of God or literally the the peace is this weaving back together of the stray parts of our life isn't that great That, that we were distracted we were anxious and now through sitting at his feet we are woven back together to become whole and healthy people And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So if you want to guard your life against anxiety, spend time at his feet. That's where it starts. That's where it flows out from. And so we can work backwards too and say, okay, if I am anxious, then the dashboards on the light of my soul need to be going off because it means I haven't really prioritized the only necessary thing. Here's how the passage continues. Martha, Martha, you're anxious and you are, say it with me, troubled, troubled, right? Troubled. If you were to do a word study on this word, it's fascinating because this word troubled makes us seem like, well, maybe Martha's just like, "Mm." but the word troubled actually has been translated, quote, making an uproar or a riot in Acts chapter 17 or a noisy disorder and a commotion in Matthew chapter 9 or to be alarmed. Martha is doing far more than just... Martha is like, hey, um, Jesus, Messiah guy, you may have recognized that I am in the kitchen making you lunch when my shady sister is sitting at your feet. If you could do something about it because you're God and all, that would be wonderful. Great. She's not just shaking her head. She's making an uproar. And see, part of Martha's troubled nature is that Mary isn't following along. She's not playing the same game. And can we talk honestly for a second? Isn't that what often gets us to? It's, hey, these people aren't playing the same game as us, and they seem happier. We need to drag them into our game. (laughs) They need to be a little bit busier. They need to do a little bit more. We need to talk them into joining, whatever, right? Isn't it true? She's upset because Mary isn't joining in. Here's the thing. Unhealthy people always create unhealthy environments. And we have to decide, are we going to just jump in line and go along with it? Or are we going to say, no, my my priorities are clear and I'm going to live by those and let them define me? And here's what Martha believes. Martha believes if it doesn't get done by me now, it won't get done by anyone ever. The reality is they probably would have eaten. It wouldn't have been as good. It wouldn't have shown up on Pinterest. Nobody would have Instagrammed a picture of it, I'm sure. But but they would have eaten something. And if they didn't, they most likely would not have died of starvation. Right? And so... Mary's choosing the only necessary thing. Martha's choosing the immediate. And the fact that Mary doesn't join in, it troubles her. I can remember Bill Hybels telling a story at a conference he was speaking at. He's a pastor of Willow Creek Church, a large church outside of Chicago. He tells a story about walking past somebody who was working in maintenance on their campus. And and he was cutting these branches. And as he worked trimming this shrub, he was whistling as he worked. And Heibel said, he said, I thought to myself, if you have enough energy to whistle, you have enough energy to work harder. (laughs) 
And then he thought, oh, wow, I'm in a really bad place. <laughs> right? Because he was overworking, and he was overextending himself, and he was overbusied. And we usually wear that as the badge of honor and courage. Like, man, I'm so important. I'm so busy. I've got so much going on. I don't even have enough time to sleep. Now, Jesus says you're lazy because you haven't prioritized your life. And when people, when we live that way and people don't join in, it causes us to be distressed or troubled. But what Jesus invites us to is this calm. See, for, for me, I know that I'm unhealthy when small things bug me, when people I love rub me wrong, when I get cynical and critical of the people that I'm working with or around, I know I'm in an unhealthy spot. What are your dashboards for your soul? And it helps us know, are, are we prioritizing the right thing? Because we're all prioritizing something. Here's how the passage ends. And I always thought it was this throwaway, path, throwaway verse. Like, this is just the end of the story. But listen really carefully to what Jesus says. But one thing is necessary. Mary has chosen the good portion. This is a terminology that's used in reference to food. M Mary's chosen the bread of life. Martha, you chose the bread of lunch. She chose the good portion, which will not be taken away from her. So here's what Jesus is saying. Not only am I going to make her leave the living room and sitting at my feet to come and help you in the kitchen, but what she learns sitting at my feet will carry her and walk with her into eternity. Because what we learn sitting at the feet of Jesus is a, a timeless treasure. It's not something that we get just here on earth. It's an eternal formation that God does in our soul. The only thing we carry with us into eternity is the people that we have become. And so what Jesus says is, listen, formation at my feet is a timeless treasure. It won't be taken away. Your character and the development of who you are in your soul is something that will walk with you into eternity. So the question becomes, how are we doing in cultivating a soul-level health? Are we walking and sitting with our God in such a way that it shapes the way that we carry everything else? Or are we just trying to do as much as we can and fit it all in? And maybe if you are, you feel like you're missing the best things in life because your life is so full. Briefly, as we close, I want to give you three pieces of encouragement and how to say Paulson, I, I'm, I'm in, but what does this really look like? What does this really mean? First of all, here's, here's what I would say. Number one is you, you, we need to spend some time prioritizing our life, deciding what's first. What is the only necessary thing for you. So maybe a way that you do this this week is you take some time and really succinctly, as best you can, write your, your vision for your life. And where does sitting at your master's feet fit into that? Right? Write the vision for your life. This is what, when it's all said and done, this is what I want my life to be about. An Australian nurse named Bonnie Ware, she cared for people in the last 12 weeks of their life. And she started to ask them, what are some of your regrets in life? People that were on their deathbed. And the number one thing people said to her was this. I wish I had had the courage to live a life true to myself, not the life others expected from me. So here's what they're saying. I wish I would have prioritized and built my life around that. Secondly, this one thing life is a life where we actually practice our spirituality. We practice spiritual disciplines. We walk with Jesus. On the back side of your bulletin, I've included nine ways that people sit at the feet of Jesus. Let me take that out, even if you're not a note taker. Nine ways that people sit at the feet of Jesus. 
And here's our default in even uh, post-reformational evangelicalism is, hey, read the Bible and pray. And listen, those are both really, really good things. I am all for read the Bible. I'm all for pray. But the reality is, is that when you read the Bible, you start to see different ways that people connect with God, that it's not the only way. And in 1996, Gary Thomas wrote a book called um, Sacred Pathways, Discovering or Discover Your Soul's Path to God. And on it are things like naturalist. Like, so maybe you connect better with God on a hike than you do anywhere else. Here's what I want to invite you to do this week. One, experiment. What ways does your soul connect best with God? How do you hear him speak to you? How do you sit best at his feet? And secondly, do it. Do it. And see if the words that he speaks aren't the life that you long for. Practice. And then finally, pause. Pause. In the, in the scriptures, we're invited to have a rhythm to our life, a rhythm to our day, and I would encourage you that, that you spend time in a given day sitting at the feet of Jesus, that we have time in our week You've carved out this hour to say, I, got him in a, I just want to be with you. I want to soak in your presence. As the scriptures would invite us to the gift of Sabbath, that we would be people who, who Sabbath and people who sleep, that we stop long enough to enjoy the life that God has given us instead of just fast forwarding through it. And you know what I've found happens in my life? When I say I want to live my life based on the rhythm that God's invited me to, where sleep and Sabbath are an actual part of it, that I start to see God in the day-to-day. If I train my soul that way, I start to see God in the, in the everyday stuff. And I just wonder if Martha had cultivated a rhythm of sleep, a rhythm of Sabbath, a rhythm of being with her, her Savior, would she have missed the fact that he was in her living room? See, so it's not just pause when it says in our calendar, but it's pause when we see God show up in the unexpected, in the uninvited, in the unanticipated to just say, we're just going to enjoy this moment because we've been visited by our great God. See, when we identify our priority, we awaken our life. And Jesus is longing is that we would, that we would move from this place of distraction to clarity, that we'd move from this place of anxiety to centered, that we'd move from this place of troubled, distressed to calm. He doesn't always change the things you carry, but he certainly changes the way that you carry them. Let's pray. Before you go running out of here, I just want to invite you to, to take a deep breath, to remember that, you, that there is a God and that you are not him, and he's doing just fine. And he sits at the center of the universe, holding it all together. And if all that's true, and and I believe with every fiber of my being that it is, then he certainly has enough strength to hold you together. So maybe this morning you just reaffirm that he is the, the only necessary thing, the thing that changes everything else, the thing underneath everything. So Jesus, we, we say that we consider our lives worth nothing except that we would know you, that we would be found in you, not with a righteousness that comes from the law, but a righteousness that comes by faith in you, that knowing you is better. And we want it to be at the, at the foundation of our lives, the very ground that we stand on, that it would shape not only the lives that we live, but it would shape the things that we carry and the way that we carry them. 
So, Father, this morning, would you use your scriptures to press on our life in such a way that it would be for our good, for our joy, for our freedom, for the glory of your name, and for the good of your world, we pray. In the name of Jesus and all God's people said, amen.